The Unshackled Waves, Episode 16. Hello and welcome to the Un... Shackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms here for this week's review episode. Uh, now, before we begin, I should uh, make an apology of some sort that the episodes over this Christmas and New Year holiday break are likely to be a bit uh, sporadic because a lot of us are busy during this time. However, I'm of the, the attitude that the, the show must go on as there are still plenty to talk about uh, in the world and also people want a podcast to, to listen to over this holiday period. Uh, my guest co-host for today is the newest contributor for The Unshackled, and uh, it is Arthur Pigeon. So welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Tim. Uh, whereabouts are you from, Arthur? I'm from New Zealand, but uh, I've lived in your wonderful country quite a bit as well, as many of us have. But you still still keep in, in touch with what's happening in Australia? Well, yes, ever, um, ever more and more, actually, because I've uh, stumbled on the unshackled and uh, some, some more sort of libertarian and conservative websites in Australia, more than what I see uh, in New Zealand, and I celebrated the wonderful Brexit in uh, Australia. So, yes, I've, I've been getting more and more interested, particularly seeing the renaissance of uh, One Nation, Pauline Hanson out of her prison cell and back into politics. Um, it's it's great, and also finding out about Corey Bernardi and uh, his ilk in the Liberal Democratic Party. Yeah, oh, well, it's 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 certainly uh, good to hear a New Zealander have a, a positive view of Australia and. Um, we'll certainly throughout the show ask you a few questions about the, the state of politics uh, in New Zealand because a lot of us here in Australia sort of view uh, New Zealand as quite a stable country at the moment. I mean, their Prime Minister just resigned uh, of his own accord while we seem to go through Prime Ministers every year. Yes, well, you know, what choice do you have when it's, uh, it's Kevin Rudd and then Julia Gillard? How can you keep either of them on? And then, um, quite frankly, Tony Abbott, uh, for all that he was an improvement on his predecessor, still fairly awful. So, you know, it's not like there isn't a reason why you do that. Yeah. Oh, it's, I, I can't wait to, to get into the comparisons, but we'll we'll start with our first topic uh, for this week, which is the uh, latest terror attacks. Which uh, there hadn't there hadn't been uh, any in the the West for a while, but uh, we we all were uh, are pretty much dragged back into reality and reminded on about just how bad the West has become. There was the uh, truck uh, crash terrorist attack in, in, at a uh, Berlin market in Germany, uh, which killed 12 people, and the, the, uh, the perpetrator of that attack is still at large. And of course, there was also the uh, ass assassination of the, the Russian ambassador in, in Turkey, uh, which, which happened live, uh, which was, which, and that was, the, the shooter left him. Uh, the shooter left us in no doubt about what his motive was. He shouted uh, "Alu Akbar," which is what most. I, I shouted "Aloha Snack Bar." Okay, is that is that what yeah, it's? Yeah. And, and also, um, you describe it as a terrorist attack. I think it was a truck attack in Berlin. A truck attack. Truck attack. Yeah, yeah, those bloody trucks. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's. Uh, 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 should we just say a market market accident? A market accident, a terrible, terrible accident. Yep, so where 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 do we start with? Um, well, well, let, well, let's start in 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 Germany. I mean, uh, uh, Angela Merkel's probably been uh, the main cause of the the current migration crisis there. Letting she's let over a million. Uh, mainly Muslim mi uh, migrants from the Middle East over the past uh, uh, 18 months. And there's been a series of, uh, of 
ter- oh, terror-related uh, attacks in Germany over the over the past year. But obviously, this is this has got the most most attention, and certainly reminds us uh, what uh, what a, per- a perilous state Germany is in at the moment. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Um, I saw Angela Merkel um, laying white flowers down at the market and I I just thought, why don't you lay down a white flag? Um, You might as well. And all of the the discourse around sadness and how saddened she is. Well, um, what about being angry? What about doing something about it? So, uh, you know, she's, she remains pretty useless. Um, You know, what about letting them all in and then saying, okay, we're going to ban the burqa? Uh, Oh, yes. That that was uh, pretty much... uh, Most people thought that was... Uh, too little, too late. I mean, it's a pretty easy thing thing for her to do. It uh, just, you know, pass a law, and it's basically uh, a form of, you know, virtue signalling. Well, you know, are you, you know, I'll do this. You know, look, it shows I'm tough, but not really. Not at all. And um, I mean, the hardest thing about her is her teeth. Um, look, she is absolutely dreadful. She's like a mad cat lady, I've heard the comparison made before, so it's <laughs> not an original thought, but um, instead of cats, she has refugees. And, um, you know, this is a, a childless woman who, um, you know, Keynes said, um, in the long run, we're all dead. Well, um, Keynes was notoriously uh, a homosexual man, and um, so he wasn't thinking about his posterity in the light of having children of his own. Uh, um, but I think it's um, it's a bit of a lesson to us, really, when we're looking at politicians. Um, do they support families? Do they have um, the same thinking about things as we, we do? Because when I look at what I care about, it's well into the future because it has to, because I have kids. So um, I find the choice of Angela Merkel really odd in the first place. Um, I don't find it that odd that she's let all of these people in. It was the easiest thing to do. And, um, you know, as you you reap, so shall you sow. Um, And and I think that we're seeing that in Germany today. We've seen it in France. Uh, um, It's even enough of a trope um, in uh, in humour and comedy. There's a guy called Saiten Atheist, and he does videos. That's S-Y-E-T-E-N, then Atheist all one word, and he does videos, there's a video series about Islam, there's one called The Truck of Peace, and they're very, they're hilarious, um, but very illuminating, and, um, you know, they kind of tell you more about what these people think um, than you'll ever hear from official sources. So I think um, that this is a big wake-up call to Germany, but they've slept through a number of wake-up calls. There are Terror, terrorist attacks in Germany all over the place, uh, and and it's actually a very dangerous place. It's not just terrorism per se. There's also other crime, um, skyrocketing rape um, and sexual assault cases, other crimes. Um, you know, the, it's time for them to to think, what's in it for me having all these people here? And I think that the answer is actually nothing. Yeah, and it's also worth pointing out that a lot of the migrant crime and uh, other of, I I don't even like to use the term, minor uh, terrorist attacks that have uh, happened in Germany this year have all been suppressed. I mean, Merkel has been very heavy-handed with the the mainstream media uh, in in Germany in suppressing uh, stories of migrant crime, and she's and she's also, you know, teamed up with with Facebook to to suppress uh, discussions by Germans about the migrant crisis. Yes, uh, and and that's incredibly worrying for Germans and for all of us in the West that that can be done. Um, and I have heard stories of, uh, not in Germany but in Sweden, uh, if you say something anti-migrant, you might have a crew turn up on your doorstep to interview you and lots of legal repercussions. Um, You know, the one thing I will say is that Germans are 
another thing that's being suppressed actually is the the resistance to this. So there are Germans out there who find out that there's going to be a migrant centre in their city, um, and you know find out where it's going to be, burn the building down before the people can come. So um, there's actually quite a bit of resistance, and you don't hear about that either. And it's, and it's worth pointing out that uh, Germany has their federal election uh, ne uh, next year, which uh, uh, Germany, at least for now, they, they still get to have their say in the privacy of, uh, of a, ballot, a ballot box. And uh, there is the alternative for Germany party, which has done well at state elections uh, this year. And so there, there is ways at the moment for, for German citizens to, to fight back. Yeah, I agree, and I, I think that it's very, very interesting um, if you consider that the Green Party has said, hey, we, we've got a good idea for immigration. We think immigrants should be people who are good for Germany, and, and they should be qualified. And so, this, so far to the left of Angela Merkel and far to the left of anyone else, and they're saying, hey, we've got some ideas on, on this too. Um, maybe we should actually be choosing, seeing as so many people want to come to Germany, and that is incredibly um, rare to hear from the left, but it is actually happening. Yeah, and uh, Germany is not the only country with uh, elections next year. There's there's one in the uh, in the Netherlands where Gert Wilders is polling uh, as the strongest party. Marie Le Pen uh, is is looking uh, poised to become uh, the Fre the French president. Uh, so yeah, there is citizens. You know, they can st they can still have their say, and uh, obviously. Uh, you know, this is a this is another wake up call uh, to the current crop of leaders, but they just don't seem to be listening. I mean, uh, after every attack, they have their sympathy, you know, sympathy with the people, saying, you know, we're we're you know not uh, we're with you, we're we're not going to be afraid, but you know, the policies are still the same. Yes, uh, well, they haven't got it yet. Um, they haven't actually worked out that there's political gold in it for them. But I think a point that you made is um, very important to reiterate, and that is that we still have a say. Um, we need to use it before we lose it, and there are things that can be done. And these points of view are very important to encourage people to do something about it. And only over the last couple of weeks, um, just in half an hour here, half an hour there, I've been asking myself, well, what can I do? in order to make sure that a breadth of political views are heard um, by everyday people, by politicians. And with all the technology that we have and the eloquence that we have uh, on our side of the political spectrum, there is an awful lot that we can do. So I think saying that um, you know there's nothing we can do about it is very um, fatalistic, and I, I, I just don't believe it's true. So I'm very glad that there are podcasts like The Unshackled and um, many others as well, where people can express such views uh, and remind each other that there is always something you can do. And I, I wonder whether some of these politicians in their echo chambers never actually hear anything to the contrary of what they already think, because people just don't bother. Yeah, uh, that's completely true, and luckily, thanks to uh, the internet and new media, I mean, the truth uh, d uh, does emerge, and uh, mainstream media and politicians can no longer collude to uh, f uh, to keep the public in the dark about what's going on. Uh, we should move on to well, there was another. Uh, I guess we should. Uh, we, you wouldn't strictly call it a terrorist attack, but it was a political assassination. The Russian ambassador to uh, Turkey. Uh, was uh, assassinated uh, at an art opening by an off-duty Turkish police officer. Um, and, yeah, he shouted, Alu Akbar, and said, don't forget uh, Aleppo. Uh, so he left us in no doubt about his, his motivation. And what I, what I uh, 
wrote about this incident was the fact that uh, the, the fact that this uh, this man was motivated to kill because of you know what Russia was allegedly doing in Aleppo. I mean, the Western news at the moment is just full of propaganda about look at the evil you know Russian and Syrian governments. They're they're bombing Aleppo to 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 smithereens. And of uh, you know we and they're basically saying you know the West must must get involved and you know we must you know support the rebels which would just be the the worst thing worst thing that could be done. I mean Aleppo has now been been liberated, so it's it's coming to the end of the conflict. But uh, the the neo conservative war drums are still being still still being beaten. Well. You're exactly right, but they're not just neoconservative uh, um, war drums, they're neoliberal war drums. And I, I, I guess there's really no difference in the policy, it's just um, which side of politics is pushing them. So, I mean, beware centrists, I say. Um, you know, Bar Barack Obama, great sort of centrist politician, um, they wanted some sort of milk toast Republican like Jeb Bush. Um, you know, these people dare to call themselves centrists and yet it's it's like the joker says in the batman movie um you know as long as there's a plan people are comfortable but what if the plan is horrifying um and, and it currently is um who they call moderate rebels um how they know who's a moderate rebel i don't know they've got it so wrong that they've um created isis they've taken the cork out of the bottle of africa as Gaddafi warned them not to do by uh, by killing him, um, and it's unleashed all the migrants across Europe. So there's a lot at stake for the West, but it, it seems like people don't understand what they're talking about with Aleppo. Um, you know, it's been this way for many years. Um, there's actually been an operation to clear out the, the last of the people who don't want to be there if the government's going to be in charge. And um, I, I don't see what all the screaming is about because it, it's been supervised by the UN. They took their time doing it, um, mainly because of probably Western intrans intransigence, really. It's a very good idea to clear out the civilians from Aleppo. Um, you know, who was stopping them from doing it? So, yeah, I mean, as you said, there's no doubt what was uh, motivating this young man, uh, but one of the, the lines that I read in an article today um, is now Russian and Turk Turkish investigators are trying to establish what turned this 22 year old police officer into a murderer. Well, uh, <laughs> um, try a bit of radical Islam, that might have something to do with it. Yeah, I mean, if uh, they, they always say, "Of oh, the the motivation is unknown at this stage." Yet yeah, we it was ca it was ca all captured on camera. I mean, uh, in all its in, in all its graphicness. Um, but going back to uh, Aleppo, um, yeah, it's uh, there was a good video put put out. Uh, I think about six uh, twelve hours after it happened by uh, Paul Joseph Watson, yeah, talking about we we talk a lot about uh, fake news on this podcast, and he went through all the, the, the fake news that was coming out of uh, Aleppo and how a lot of the so-called uh, citizens of Aleppo are filming YouTube videos were actually uh, bloggers. Uh, and and there was uh, a lot of the the footage wasn't actually uh, from Aleppo. So yeah, the 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 West there was so much um, so so much propaganda, and it, it's it, it was meant to feed into this whole of uh, uh, I'm going to use the term again neo conservative narrative that Russia is still you know the devil and Satan and uh, Obama's uh, Obama said and uh, this feeds into the 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 story that oh, Russia hacked the, the US election. I mean, he's only got one month left to go, but he said he still wants to retaliate against Russia. So uh, you know, uh, even though Trump wants to make uh, wants to make peace with Russia, there's still uh, the media and uh, the political establishment who, who are still trying to fuel, fuel the flames of conflict between the two countries. Absolutely, it's incredibly scary. Um, and you know, Hillary 
Clinton couldn't even keep it in her pants well enough to hide the fact that she wanted a war with Russia. But um, the only the only thing the Russians can actually do to America is uh, launch a lot of nuclear warheads at it, because otherwise they're kind of outmatched. Um, but they can do that easily enough. So it, it's actually terrifying. The whole thing is terrifying. And, and what would be the goal and what would be the likely outcome of a war? Um, I mean, it's all very obscure to go into bat for ISIS so hard when Russia are the only ones actually fighting against ISIS effectively in Syria alongside the Syrian government who, uh, you know, we've got reasons not to like them, but um, so what? Uh, ISIS is by far the greater evil. Yeah, I mean, we've known for years that the the Syrian rebels are made up of elements of ISIS and Al Qaeda, and we saw we'd we'd already seen the disaster that had happened with removing Gaddafi in Libya, and so um, uh, none of none of us who you know understood this situation could uh, could, uh, could see why that the Western governments were were trying to overthrow Assad. I mean, uh, we, we'd already we'd already seen what, what had happened, and so um, it's it, it's just been. Uh, I mean, the reason why this Aleppo conflict is is has been as brutal as it been is because the the Western governments have enabled the rebels. Yes, um, I can't imagine it would have gone on for so long um, if if it weren't for that. Uh, and it's it's an incredibly sad situation. But what you were saying before about the Paul Joseph Watson video is interesting as well because they've even gone so far as to say, um, you know, there's all these videos, people saying good goodbye from Aleppo. Um, but you know, who who's forced them to make those videos? And then there's the other videos allegedly showing the carnage in Aleppo. And yeah, that's what I mentioned before. One of them was a music video. I mean, that's fairly easily proven. It's very sloppy. Uh, and, of course, there are no Western journalists there. No. But um, probably quite a few Russian ones. Yeah, I mean, uh, even though I know that it's owned by the uh, the Russian government, I still I still watch uh, RT from from time to time because it's only it's one of the only ways you can get a alternative uh, perspective on on world affairs. Yeah, I agree, and it's also quite shocking because you look at it and you see what they're saying about um, you know stuff in the West that you might know a little bit more about than the average Russian, and you think my god they've got it quite wrong and then you start thinking well um you know who's to say that our media is any less um corrupt than that or um any less i mean the bbc is directed by the government um and of course they they hate certain governments to a certain extent but they're still funded by them they're still dependent so how is rt any different Sorry about that noise. Johnny autoplay on um, a video of the the truck attack. Oh uh, yeah, uh, keep going. <laughs> um, yeah. So, but if you look at RT, you can see that bias that comes through when you're state sponsored, um, and you have to look at Canadian Broadcasting Company, British Broadcasting Company, Australian Broadcasting Company, and all of the uh, Radio New Zealand's a good example as well. All of these uh, government-funded broadcasters um, all tow a certain party line. Um, and it's worse than that as well because in the West where we, we should be able to make um, unbiased journalism, it's all been taken over by one sort of special interest or another to the point where you can't even get a good idea of what's going to happen in the upcoming election on Brexit, um, you know, the American election. Uh, you have to go to so-called alternative news to find out um, anything close to the truth. I mean, if you're talking fake news, it's fake news to say that Hillary Clinton was ever anywhere near close to winning that election. Um, you know, if the mainstream media had reported it 
um, correctly, then there wouldn't have been the surprise element of Trump's victory. Yeah, uh, and I tend to agree that uh, the coverage of Aleppo, I mean, it's it's just a perfect example of, you know, why the mainstream media is is not listened to anymore and why people are going to uh, alt alternative news sites because uh, they've just been, uh, the public have just been lied to time and time again. Yes, it's, um, it's a crying shame. Um, but, you know, I think... Um, the situation in Syria is a very long-running problematic thing that is, you know, it's not going to get too much better anytime soon. But a lot of the coverage that you see doesn't even really acknowledge the fact that they've actually um, just escorted a whole bunch of people out of there who didn't want to be there anymore. Um, uh, in fact, one of the most recent things uh, in the news about Aleppo is that there was a bombing at a Christmas market. So that was a, a little bit of a surprise for me because I didn't know that it was a, uh, a largely Christian town. Uh, but it's Christian enough that, um, you know, they, while the West is saying, oh, my God, it's terrible, there's um, terrible carnage going on, the Russians are killing everyone, um, they're actually trying to celebrate Christmas, um, you know, like in Berlin and around about as successfully. But, um, you know, it just goes to show that the reality on the ground is that people are actually trying to pick up and move on. Yeah, definitely. Well, we'll go back to Australia now where it just broke uh, this morning uh, that uh, last night there was a uh, an attack, or uh, should we call it that, uh, that uh, a van uh, uh, packed with uh, gas cylinders uh, crashed into the headquarters of the Australian Christian Lobby, uh, which uh, cops a lot of uh, criticism from uh, the, uh, the media on the left because it holds conservative views and the Australian Federal Police uh, said that uh, it was not politically, religiously or ideologically motivated even though they've only briefly spoken to the the driver of the van who's been in sur surgery most of the time. Uh, so it's, but, but they already know that uh, it wasn't motivated by anything so uh, did he just crash into that building just by pure coincidence? Well, look, it sounds to me like a, a gas delivery. Um, you know, someone's <laughs> a whole bunch of gas, um, and then, you know, um, the driver's got lost, and, um, and, and it's just spontaneously combusted at, at the wrong place at the wrong time. And, and the fact that it was the Christian, Australian Christian lobby, um, well, that's just a coincidence. Yeah, I, I mean... When I when I heard this that this had happened this morning, um, I've, I normally check my phone when I'm still half asleep, and I saw this, and I thought, well, that doesn't seem true. That that uh, uh, that doesn't seem like it happened. But when I you know turned on the TV during breakfast, I was like, wow, this you know actually happened in Australia, which is you know let's call it what it is. It 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 had all the hallmarks of a terrorist attack. I mean, the gas cylinders there, you know, is obviously to cause an explosion. So that's that that's quite scary that that uh, that this could happen in Australia it's very scary um, and uh, you know it's kind of not the first time though so I mean it's the first time of this type perhaps but there's been a number of uh, attempted attacks um, you know there's been bizarre happenings with an asylum seeker wandering in and self-immolating in a bank um, alongside some other people um, who were also very badly injured in Melbourne just last month, uh, a Rohingya man, I believe. Uh, so there seems to be a bit of a, a common thread, and it's hard to look at this and think that it, it wasn't politically motivated. Um, and and the, the theory that it was motivated by nothing at all um, well, good luck trying to get people to believe that. Um, but the big question is, or the big, the bigger question, is why would they be trying to get people to believe that this was uh, some kind of accident or it was, um, you know, an attack motivated by 
nothing. I mean, Lyle Shelton, uh, the head of the, the Christian lobby, uh, in his uh, talking to the media this morning, he was visibly shaken by, you know, what had happened. I mean, uh, I'm not surprised that, you know, they get, you know, threatening phone calls uh, all, the, all the time. Uh, and they're certainly not the only conservative organisation that gets it. But, you know, they're just calls and emails, which most of the time you just ignore. But, yeah, uh, a van ploughing into, uh, in, into your headquarters, that's that's a completely different thing. Yes, and I would be very worried if that um, had happened to an organisation I was affiliated with and I was being told or the, the public was being told that this was not um, somehow motivated. So, yeah, I hope they've been keeping their threatening emails. Uh, so there's obviously still uh, investigation is uh, ongoing. It could just turn out to be an amazing coincidence and a random uh, crash, but uh, f uh, forgive us for being quite sceptical of that narrative. Yes, fair enough. Uh, it, could, it could be a worldwide tour of the truck of peace, and um, that's <laughs> something we don't want. <laughs> Uh, so, so we'll move on from uh, terror-related uh, matters. Well, there was well, there was quite a lot that happened. We'll move earlier in the week. Uh, we were we got another uh, brutal reminder here in Australia about the state of the the federal budget with the release of the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook, which is commonly referred to as MyEFO, and. It, confirmed that the deficits over the next few years would blow out by another 10 billion and that we are going to be back in surplus by 2020 21 which is i think because we were told by uh julie gillard and wayne swan that the budget would return a surplus in 2012 13 that wouldn't happen uh joe hockey said uh in opposition that they would return the budget to surplus in their first year that that didn't happen so but we are apparently going to reach surplus eventually um I, I've, I've become quite sceptical of these claims. I'll believe it when when I see it. And uh, we were lucky also in Australia to not get our credit uh, downgraded. Um, there's still $20 billion worth of spending cuts being uh, blocked in the Senate. So it's we're, we're in a pretty bad, uh, bad budget p uh, position in Australia. And the economy also had negative growth this September quarter. So it's, it's quite concerning. Um, yeah, Arthur, you're obviously from uh, New Zealand, uh, which I personally am envious of your budget situation. I'm not sure uh, what, what your view is on the state of our finance. Well, um, I, I have to admit that I don't pay that much attention to it, but um, I, you know, in, in general, Western governments, well, governments around the world are operating with huge deficits, um, so it's kind of a normal thing. It's very worrying. Um, I think New Zealanders, uh, I think we had a, a budget surplus. The government had a very small yes. budget um, and then there was a big earthquake uh, that ripped huge fault lines across the landscape and you know some of them are like a canyon um, and you know roads have disappeared into them and rail lines and towns have been cut off uh, and will be cut off for months and you just think well there goes the budget sur surplus so um, it's you know it's good to have one um, but I think when you look at stuff that's projected for, uh, it was projected for 2012 and now it's projected to be 2020, I think it's fair enough to say, well, um, it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. You know? we're, we're, so, we're so often uh, you know, misled by, by politicians. Uh, it's interesting to point out that... Um, uh, a lot. A lot of the commentary says that. Oh well, um, you know, uh, the coalition government would be able to, you know, cut deeper if it wasn't for this damn Senate uh, blocking everything. But in New Zealand, uh, you have what is uh, it's called mixed member proportionate, which is a form of proportional representation, which makes it nearly impo oh, almost impossible for one party to get a majority. Yes, um, and. It's, that's quite interesting because 
in New Zealand, the, the left is really splintered across a whole bunch of parties. The biggest um, left coalition um, would be the Labour and the Greens, and they've got about 37%. National has been sitting uh, on about 48, 49% for a long time. Uh, and then there's some other small parties. But, um, you know, they can make a government with one um, one big party and two small parties. So, um, but the, the governments that you would have on the left uh, would be five-headed monsters. So they never really occur because people, you know, even the, the leader of the Labour Party is thinking, I don't really want to be um, a leader of that type of coalition even if they could put it together. So it, it's it's an interesting thing. Um, New Zealand's very lucky. We don't have states. We don't have um, a Senate. Um, so it's a unicameral parliament. Um, so the layers of government are that much less. Um, and, and it does mean that we we see a broad range of representation politically on the left, on the right, um, there isn't much. I mean, I wouldn't call the National Party um, in any way a right-wing party. Um, but, you know, it's it's still something that functions reasonably well. And small parties get a look in. Yeah, I, I think certainly there's a, there's a role for uh, minor parties, which is why I quite, uh, I don't like the Senate being blamed for everything. I mean, the Senate is still uh, elected by the people. So uh, you have to, uh, governments of the, of the day have to, have to work with the, the cross benches. But I think if the, uh, as I always say in politics, if you're, if you're, you know, passionate about something, you can, you can make it happen, happen. I mean, they, if they wanted to get, want, wanted to get serious about budget repair, they, they could, um, but they're, they're just too afraid of, you know, what the uh, special interest group and groups and rent sinkers will say. I mean, our welfare bill is still, uh, you know, extremely, extremely high in Australia. That's, that, that's the reason why the budget's in, in poor, poor shape. You just need, uh, you just need politicians to really, you know, gain, gain a spine and prepare to take on people. Yeah, I agree. And it seems that um, there is, I mean, I recall being in Australia when Julia Gillard was Prime Minister and um, she was making a speech about the carbon tax and um, she, she was saying, Australians need assistance. And I thought, by crikey, do they, do they ever? Um, now, if you went around as a politician in New Zealand saying that New Zealanders need assistance, um, you know, you would pretty soon have someone saying, listen, mate, what do you think we are? What, why do you think that we need your help? Um, and, you know, it's, but it was pretty blatant to me saying Australians need assistance, that it was just going to be a bribe. Um, and, and there's a palpable difference between the two countries in attitudes towards, um, you know, bludging, basically. Yeah, that's uh, so. In New Zealand, there's uh, there, there's a lot less tolerance for bludgers. Yeah, a lot less. Uh, that... um, we have bludgers, but uh, we don't like them. That, that's uh, that's what's really concerned me. I, I might add over the past ten years in Australia that uh, there seems to, uh, like, yeah, but yeah, uh, it used to be that you know bludging was really bad, but now everyone you know wants want, wants something from the government. That's why it's so hard for for governments to take benefits benefits away, and even even middle class people still complain if if something's taken away from them. Well, I understand that because um, middle class people are the ones who are paying for it all. So why wouldn't you want something back? Yes. Well, it wasn't a good way to or to end the year economically. It's we've still we've still got 
a, a long way to go to, well, not only fix the budget, but kickstart the economy again. Uh, we'll move on to, oh, well, we talk about this pretty much every second episode, more ludicrous attacks on free speech, uh, thanks to uh, 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act. Now, Arthur, I know that this is a topic which is, um, even though you're from New Zealand, you follow this debate quite closely. So do you want to uh, discuss the latest developments? Yes, well, I mean, I think a lot of your listeners and viewers will know that um, there is Section 18C um, of the Racial Discrimination Act uh, and there's been a complaint made uh, against a war memorial in, I believe it's in Sydney, um, and this war memorial kind of um, depicts the comfort women of the, you know, for the Japanese in World War II. Comfort women um, is one term for it, a polite way of saying sex slave. Um, and most of them were Korean or, uh, or Chinese, of course. And so the Japanese community apparently thinks that this um, war memorial uh, that depicts what women went through and is a reminder of um, the terrible practices of the Japanese in World War II is somehow inciting hatred. Um, I'm not quite sure how um, mentioning facts um, incites hatred, but um, it, it is quite interesting because some of the complainants who don't even want to put their actual names on the complaint but are known by, um, and one of them was, is um, quoted as Emiko, um, and she's saying, well, there were only 20,000 comfort women, um, and they were all well-paid prostitutes. Um, and so saying anything else is um, just, you know, it's disgusting and it's dreadful abuse of Japanese and it's against 18C. Um, so that is very, very interesting. Um, it's very easy for people to say, well, this camp complaint has no legs and will be struck down by the court. But actually, uh, I would be a little bit worried about that because, uh, I mean, how do we know what might happen? Look at the bunch of people looking after this and ask yourself, um, you know, are they all social justice warriors? Um, and I think the answer is probably quite a few of them are. So anything could happen out of this. Um, and, and then we have the Human Rights Commission is going to be asked to really um, make a statement either way whether they think that it was historically accurate. Um, and then, of course, there could be a legal argument saying, well, yes, it is historically accurate to um, say that there were sex slaves for the Japanese in World War II, um, but it's still inciting hatred, so we need to strike it down. Um, I, I think that this is a very interesting complaint because it actually shows um, that, you know, the use of this and the abuse of it uh, is, is quite a problem for Australian free speech. Um, who could have ever thought that such a thing would be considered as some kind of hate speech? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all... Uh all fair and well to have debates over, you know, historical events and, you know, dis discuss that. But bringing the government into, I, I guess, silence one side, I mean, that, that's just ridiculous. I mean, we should be able to freely, freely discuss things and, you know, get, getting the government getting the government here and the whole legal process, I mean, this just makes uh, a, a complete mockery of, of free speech. And it, it seems to me, even though these, these, the cases seem to, of 18C seem to be getting more absurd, of, you know, Labour, the Greens and other uh, people, they're like, no, but it's still, it's, it's overall uh, goal is still, is still good. And so we must keep 18C, even though, you know, we're seeing it pretty much, you know, descend into ridiculousness. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you just um, go by the intentions of things, then um, a lot of things are good. But, um, you know, it's the practice of it rather the, than the intention of it that we need to worry about. So, um, and, and I'm, I am very, I don't think that racial um, 
you know, even incitement to hatred, um, you know, it, it's so what if somebody comes and tells me to hate Jews, um, it's my decision whether or not to listen to them or whether to just go, oh, I don't really think I like you. Maybe I won't talk to you again. I think that's a much more powerful um, way. And then, then you also have the situation where somebody says, well, no, it's not a violation of ATC. Um, and therefore, you know, you can say whatever you like about that bunch of people. Um, I mean, it's, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's bound to be inconsistent and capricious and um, it's bound to swing with the politics of the day. Uh, often these laws, uh, like I mentioned before, they, you know, have good intentions, but uh, they're often used by those who are most easily offended to silence, you know, reasonable political discourse. I mean, we've seen that with the Queensland University of Te uh, Technology uh, case that, you know, uh, what... what what is, you know, considered just a, a discussion, you're now, you know, it's making people afraid to speak, oh, you know, this innocuous comment, you know, I might get sued for it. Yes. Um, or someone might write something under your name and, uh, and you've got a problem. Uh, I, I noticed that Callum Thwaites has um, rejected the apology of that um, Terry Butler woman. The, um, the case was, the defamation case was settled uh, uh, late last week. Uh, Terry Butler uh, agreed to pay, uh, I think it was a five-figure sum, sum to Callum, and like she did offer, uh, I'm not sure if the apology was accepted, but an apology, uh, proper apology was part of the, uh, was part of the, the settlement. Um, uh, it's interesting uh, those on the left would say, oh, he's for free speech, but then he sued, you know, Terry Butler for, for what she said. But I think if you, you know, make a, you know, a, this is why, like, I think defamation law is still valid. If you make a, you know, untrue or potentially damaging allegation against somebody. I use the example if you, like, spread a rumour that somebody is a pedophile, I mean, you should be able to have a recourse for that. Absolutely. Um, and and yet, you know, if, if you look at back to the example of um, the, the complaint against the war memorial, um, there's got to be somebody telling me that this is hateful. Because I don't see that. Um, you know, somebody spreads a false rumour about someone that they're a paedophile, that's obviously uh, defamation, it's wrong, it's damaging, um, it's untrue. But um, now now we're getting into the territory of arguing about um, hate facts. Um, you know, like, it, it's a very different kettle of fish. But um, something that struck me when I, I was writing my piece about Schert Wilders was um, that, you know, if we look at hateful speech in the world, um, Schert Wilders got done in the Netherlands because he said that they, um, that, well, actually he didn't say anything. He asked a crowd of his supporters, would you like more Moroccans or fewer? And um, the crowd responded that they would like fewer. Predictable, I think, um, given who he was speaking to, but it was also televised. And um, then he said, well, well, we'll see about that. So basically, um, you know, he's, he said, do you think that we should have more of this group of people in our country or not? Um, you know, this isn't talking about Dutch-born people or citizens. This is outsiders. And um, he had a complaint made against him under the relevant legislation. And it was upheld. He was convicted. Uh, and he was mighty pissed off. But uh, you look at that and you think, hang on, there, there is somebody asking a question uh, from an audience and being convicted of some kind of incitement, uh, incitement to racial hatred. Whereas the Quran says um, that Jews are like apes and that Christians are unbelievers, you shouldn't be friends with them, you should uh, terrorize non-Muslims. And all of this very hateful speech that is a direct incitement 
and is uh, not infrequently acted upon uh, by people of that faith uh, with catastrophic and fatal results. Please excuse the... Um, it is Christmas time after all, there's a bit of noise. They'll be gone in a second. Um, but yeah. the, the Quran is pretty hateful. So to be unable to... Um, bloody Santa. Um, to be unable to question that, uh, to be unable to speak about whether you want more of it or less, uh, I think that's really, really terrible. Um, but I, I think that if we're going to have laws about what you can say, and it's going to be banned um, if it's hateful, then the people of Holland should be able to have the option of banning the Quran. Um, and so I went on a bit of a, a search for examples of um, people standing up for exactly that, and I actually found, um, funnily enough, uh, 18C, um, some people think that the Quran is in breach of 18C, and there's currently a petition to ban the sale of the Quran in Australia for exactly that reason, that it breaches um, 18C, and it pretty clearly does. There's a whole list of examples from the Quran of what it is um, that point out that this is quite um, quite a hateful and inciting book um, if you actually bother to go and look at it. So um, that was very interesting as well and I think you know it's there seems to be a growing thought in the minds of people that if things can be censored um, then does that just apply to the speech of ordinary people? Uh, does it apply to all groups, all races of people, um, does everyone have to keep their nose clean, or is this actually an instrument that's just died to um, to put down certain points of view in society? Yeah, it's it's worth pointing out that often these laws against free speech, they're 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 not aimed to protect, uh, as they see it, white people or privileged people. I mean, they're only for as as they as they as the left perceive uh, oppressed minorities. So it's certainly of uh, with these laws, there's not there's definitely not equality before the law, which is although I sort of think this is you know a good idea to have an eight, uh, 18C complaint against the Quran. Uh, I doubt the the Human Rights Commission is going to. Of uh, take any serious action on that? No, um, but I was surprised um, to find it and see that it had um, several thousand signatures. So uh, people are thinking about it, um, and I think that you know if if eighteen C only criminalises the speech of c certain sectors of society then other sectors of society should think about whether that um, law serves their needs at all. Or maybe, just maybe, there should be um, open slather on free speech. Um, and, you know, maybe it's actually better to have free speech so that we know what our politicians think, for instance. And this was a point that I made in the Hert Filders article. Um, you know, how it is supposed to work is that the politician gets up there and they say, um, okay, I I advocate um, this vile practice, um, and you say, okay, well, I won't vote for you. Um, but if they think, hmm, I can't say what I really think, but what I can do is sneak my way into power and then spring it on the unsuspecting public, um, That that's pretty worrying. Uh, and we have to remember that Kiat Wilders has gone from being uh, a vilified um, and real minority kind of a person um, within the political life of the Netherlands to being the leader of what looks to be set to the biggest party in Parliament next time round. Yes, we're definitely hoping that uh, he's able to, to win the, the Dutch election next year and hopefully we'll be able to repeal some of these ridiculous laws against 
against free speech, which of course not just exist in Australia, but around the Western world. Um, but that is all we have uh, time for uh, on today's podcast. So thank you, Arthur, for, for joining us for the first time. No worries. It's been my pleasure. And uh, before we wrap up, uh, just a few announcements. Uh, we had the, the first uh, Australian right-wing safe space meetups. There was one in Melbourne uh, on uh, Wednesday the 14th, uh, which, was, uh, which was very successful and, and uh, well attended. And we also had, had the Sydney meetup, uh, which was on Saturday uh, the uh, 17th. Uh, so that was also a great night, and it was also when all the unshackled editors met in person for the first time, so that was uh, a great event to have. And another announcement is that we have launched our uh, uh, Unshackler Awards, which uh, uh, we we have ten categories for uh, for different people who we who we think uh, deserve awards. There, uh, some of these awards are for uh, people of merit, and some of those are for people who are, uh, who have been quite destructive this year. So so far, we have launched our Regressive of the Year Award, which you can now vote for on the Unshackled website and there is also we have just launched today the Patriot of the Year and so we have eight more uh, categories which we'll be releasing over the coming days and we will announce the winners on Australia Day to coincide with the Australian of the Year so make sure that you uh, vote and uh, we, uh, we will announce the announce the winners then. So uh, it's it's our way of recognising who who's been good in twenty sixteen and who's who who has who hasn't been a, a welcome presence. So make sure you you check that out. And also uh, you know, just a reminder that you can support the site. Uh, that we have a support section of our website where you can become a patron on Patreon. You can donate via PayPal and you can also uh, sign up to be an advertiser on this podcast or on the on the web page or in one of our videos so make sure that you check that out if you've got a business that you'd like to uh, promote so uh, and also don't forget to subscribe to the show on iTunes Stitcher TuneIn Radio or if you like uh, subscribe to the video version on YouTube so that is it for us today thank you for listening and of course a Merry Christmas yes it's I am going to say that and also a happy happy new year if uh, uh, I hope we will have an episode uh, episode uh, before the new year. Um, I'm certainly hoping to, to make sure that we still put episodes uh, out. Uh, so thanks once again, and we'll see you next time. Bye.